Welcome to this episode of Let's Be Civil. Today's guest on Let's Be Civil is Alex Burkhart. Alex Burkhart tells me that he is a concrete precaster with type three cement coursing through his veins. He took his first position in the industry at age 16. Today, he serves as a project manager for Smith Midland Corporation. He is a graduate of Texas State University in the concrete industry management program. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Let's Be Civil, and uh, Alex is uh, here today, and you can see behind him a car with a little dust, and so that's that's not an accidental, you know, back end coming out from behind him. He's He enjoys uh, cars and, and racing around, and he and I have uh, been to the F1 track out here in Austin uh, several times, and talk a lot about cars and he's a car guy I think would you agree that you get labeled as a car that guy that is what I is what I call myself that's okay, correct he calls himself a car guy he asked me one day if I was a car guy I'm not a car guy I'm a guy who likes cars uh, so I don't <laughs> I don't tinker with them too much um, and then with the car I have now there's nothing to tinker with so um, so uh, welcome welcome to the podcast Alan or Alan Alex um, thank you. Thank you. Something else on my brain there for a second. Um, thanks for thanks for being here. Uh, so, tell us a little bit about your your racing background or your your car background. How do you how did you get into cars? So the car background definitely falls in, or the blame for it would be my father. Uh, he has been into cars all my life. Um, so naturally, with that. I then followed suit with it through his hoppiness. And he started out with a 67 Mustang back in high school or college at the U of I in Champaign. And then um, he had several Datsun Z cars and then some Thunderbirds, an RX-7 that he still currently has and a couple of Corvettes as well. So I've been exposed to lots of different makes and um styles of cars and that's why i call myself a car guy as opposed i like all cars that are fast and fun as opposed to i'm a chevy guy or i'm a ford right. guy that only right. like this right. particular i like right. anything that's fast and handles well right so I, I will add here um that you and i have uh been out on the f1 track in i forget what car we we drove but we you shot video we were in your Nissan, if I remember. Oh, correctly. so it was the it was because you wanted to drive in it. Yeah, yeah, it, which I've gotten to do multiple times now <laughs> too. So I've, I've, that that's fun. I, I would recommend to anybody if they have a chance to go take their car out onto a real racetrack. To even even if you have to go at the parade pace that we more or less were forced to, to travel at, it's it's still fun to see from from that perspective. So. Um, so I'm, I'm on a run here that in, in the first group of, of podcasts that I did, pretty much everybody was a civil engineer that I talked, not everybody, but, but the majority, it seems to have flip-flopped, uh, for this second run of, of interviews that it's like most everybody is not, um, a civil engineer by education and, and profession. And you fall into that category too. Um, but you you work on what would be considered infrastructure uh, projects in, in in the work that you do, um, and and which is is uh, precasting concrete elements. So why don't you why don't you give us a little bit of some insight into what is it that you you do, what the company you work for does, and I think you've got a, a project or two that we can take a couple peeks at some some images. Sure, absolutely. So I do work for a precaster, <clears throat> and I am what the typical person would just say a project manager. However, we'd like to call ourselves projects managers here uh, because I don't get to just deal with one, I deal with a dozen at a time. Um, I probably have close to 
15 current projects that I am managing all at various stages from submittal to production to installation to close out. Um, <clears throat> but the company that I work for is uh, Smith Midland Corp. And we are based out of Midland, Virginia, which is about an hour outside of Washington, DC, outside the district. And we produce a variety of different products. We are one of the few precasters in the country that do both architectural precast and structural precast. Typically there's a distinction of you do either or. Uh, it's not very common that you see people do both. <clears throat> and then in, a, in addition to that, we also do a little pre-stressing and not just uh, precast, which again, most precasters either do all pre-stress or only traditional reinforcing. So we dabble in all four categories of that. So I'll give a little little uh, dictionary here. So precast means you're actually fabricating a concrete element um, at, a, at a facility that then gets shipped to wherever it is installed as opposed to bringing a concrete truck to the location and, and placing the concrete, uh, taking the concrete out of the truck and putting it into to the structure. You guys actually fabricate, manufacture a, a, a product and ship it. Um, then then pre-stressing is actually putting steel cables uh, inside uh, the concrete. Or, and there's a couple of different ways to do that, but you pull it, the concrete, gain strength, you let go of the steel, it's like a rubber band, it tries to go back to its original length and, and there's benefits in squishing the concrete. And then you mentioned structural and architectural. So the structural side is actually something that's meant to be load bearing when it goes and is put in place. The architectural side is 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 appearance, it is just Correct. really there for, uh, uh, for, for the aesthetic value. Um, and so you guys, like you said, most most manufacturing fa uh, facilities will will sort of focus on one or two of those. You guys kind of dabble in all of them. Correct. But but your main your main product line would be precast of of architectural or is it precast of. So it depends on how you break it up. If you yeah. break it up via dollar volume, the architectural stuff is much more expensive. So it okay. equates to a higher dollar volume. But if, if looking in terms of volume of concrete, the structural outweighs it immensely. Oh, okay. okay. So, and with our location here on the East Coast in relation to DC and even the New York market, we do get a good mix of things. Now, in the project management department, I do predominantly deal with the structural stuff. I have been doing some architectural projects, but predominantly I'm dealing with the structural stuff. So talk a little bit about how you end up at Smith Midland. <clears throat> so and maybe that goes back to like, how did you end up in doing what you, you did to get to the, you know? <laughs> sure, I, I can give a, yeah. a brief background on that. So. Um, I grew up in the precast industry. Uh, my father worked uh, for a precaster for 28 years and was a part owner in a company in the Chicagoland area. Um, so I worked there as a grunt starting off with and then dad encouraged me to do uh, drafting in high school and then after I had taken those classes I started working in the office as opposed to just a laborer out in the plant. And then through that, I learned that it was an industry that was the modern stone age is what I like to call it. Um, and it was an industry that I knew I would enjoy and that it was a industry going someplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I knew that if I wanted to go someplace with it, that I needed to have a good education for it. So which what led me to discover the concrete industry management program, uh, which is where I met you. Right. Now, <clears throat> that's a rather specialized program, um, and there were only four universities at the time that offered it, and I believe there's still only four yeah. now. Yeah. And when I was looking at the four, the original one is in Middle, middle State, Tennessee, yeah. which yeah. I was considering, also a very large school uh, for the program. So it, it was a contender. There's one in New Jersey, which I considered was too expensive, wasn't really an option. 
There was one in California, also rather expensive to live, didn't want to go there. And then there was one in Texas, which I didn't really think a whole lot of. My in-laws had just moved to Texas, so that was kind of pulling it. But the nail in the coffin was when I was making the decision, uh, Austin, Texas, which is where Texas State is located nearby, got the Formula One uh, race contract there at Circuit of the Americas. And it was that was a no-brainer. Um, because Texas State is approximately oh a half an hour or forty five minutes away from that track, it was like, right. well, I need to go there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I and, think it, I think in some class I had mentioned that I had an interest in Formula One, and then that was it. You you you, you came up afterwards, and we started talking, and and the rest is history. That's right. Right. So I got the formal education there at Texas State uh, through the Concrete Industry Management Program, and great program. I think I made a great choice in going there as opposed to the other programs. Now, obviously, I'm biased. However, Texas loves their concrete, mm -hmm. and I don't, none of the other schools are in a position, nor I think is there any other place in the country where you can drive an hour and go to so many quarries, ready mix plants, precast plants, pre-stress plants, right. and cement plants. Right. I mean, between right. Austin and San Antonio, there's what, four right. or five cement yeah. plants? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's any other place in the country that has that. Right. Right. So it was positioned so well. Now, I didn't realize that at the time, but in hindsight, pretty good location. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it was also a smaller program as opposed to middle state. Tennessee, yeah. which the smaller program allotted me a lot of opportunities. I mean, you and me traveled to how many conventions yeah, and conferences yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was quite enjoyable as a college right. student. I think I, the school paid for me to go to a you lot of places. You took advantage of the opportunities. I mean, every, it was there for everybody and just every, you know, everybody doesn't realize the, the benefits. They, they got to take advantage to, to know, but Right. I mean, we went to England on yeah. that spring break trip and built yeah. that bridge. Yeah. Um, so from there, part of that program requires an internship. So my father was getting out of the business um, and I was looking to strike out on my own to learn some other experiences besides just going back to work at the company that I grew up with. So dad said, well, how about we go uh, to a convention, particularly the National Precast Concrete Convention, NPCA, and he'd introduce me to all his buddies. Right. So we went there um, and he walked me around the show, introduced me to a bunch of people over the course of two days and um, gave me plenty of compliments of, hey, he's a mover and shaker in this program um, and he's looking for an internship. And through that, I probably got 20 different leads for interns, internships, ranging everywhere from the East Coast, the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest, and everywhere in between. Right. So in making the decision of where I wanted to go, Smith Midland in particular had gotten a project that they were going to do a just-in-time manufacturing on, which is unheard of in the precast industry. Typically, you want to get out ahead of a project and trying to do something just in time or lean manufacturing isn't possible purely because you can't make something as fast as what the customer wants it. So that was something that was different that sparked my interest that, hey, I want to go experience that. I don't mm -hmm. know if I necessarily want to live in Virginia, but I want to learn that from my internship. So that was the spark and they were competitive as far as an internship offering. So that brought me here. I learned, learned about that, had a good experience. And then when you it did that for a summer, right? Correct. For a yeah. summer internship. The following year when I graduated, all the guys that missed out on me for an internship were interested in hiring me full time as well as Smith Midland. So in doing that and interviewing and traveling for those interviews, Smith Midland offered me the most competitive package. And also with its location close to Washington, DC, construction is very, very cyclical with ups and downs. However, there always seems to be construction going on in the DC market, even mm -hmm. during the low times. So it's positioned securely right, here. Right. So there's some benefit and security in doing that. Right, not so, so worried about the ups and downs, but but I will say say this, and probably you can can think back to the Chicago days. You know, these kind of projects take a long time to develop, and so once they get going, it's hard to stop them. 
sure. which means that the ups and downs in, in, in the civil engineering and the construction industries are not as dramatic uh, most of the time are not going to be these wild fluctuations because things have been going on for so long. They just kind of keep moving. They so, have so much momentum. It, right, correct. right. So it's helpful. Uh, but then if you're in a position like you're saying, where there seems to always be something that just, that just helps smooth out those bumps even more. Right. So, so what do you, so as a project manager, what does that mean? Or projects manager, what does that mean? <laughs> like when you, when you arrive to work, uh, in the morning? What, what, what's a day like for you? So a day like for me, um, typically I do have two sons uh, that are, let's see, Ridge is three years old and Hal is, has just turned one. So my wife also works. So a typical day for me starts off with me getting the boys ready and dropping them off at daycare. Um, and then I get into the office around 7 a.m., um, and I do fly a desk predominantly, um, and we are connected to the manufacturing plant. Um, it shares a wall to the office building, so we're right here in the manufacturing location. Um, and for me, it involves managing risks on a project um, and the things that we have covered and the things that we don't have covered and the discovery of that and scope creep. But it's also my responsibility to represent the customer here in terms of quality. Um, so when that happens quite regularly, and then I visit job sites quite often as well um, to see where we're at with that. So as a project manager, I start, typically I'm involved with the estimating of projects. And then once the project gets awarded, I'm involved with there all the way through the drawing the drafting, the submittal, the approval, the production of it, uh, the shipping, the installation, and then the punch list items. So I, I see it from birth to grave. Is there any kind of a typical time frame for the work that you do, or, or is it really very, uh, you know, what ranges quite a bit? It ranges quite a bit. A there are projects that are fast paced and they might be from start to finish four months. And then there are other projects. I mean, I'm still working on a project since that started off around when I started here four years ago. Oh, wow. It wasn't closed out. So <laughs> that's, that's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and they vary from projects that are only a couple of hundred thousand dollars to projects that are over $10 million and they just take longer. Do you have any um, uh, photos of, of the plant that, that you're able to share or, or I know you have sent some of some projects, but I just was curious if there was anything where you could see um, what it looks like to, to where you fabricate, where you manufacture the product. So I don't necessarily have um, any photos of the plant. However, uh, Google Maps is quite useful. Okay. <laughs> so I can show you something with that. Let's see if I can share the screen here. So I was interviewing somebody that was at their, uh, in their career, for the same job or same company for 40 years. And I was asking him about how technology has changed, you know, during that 40 year time. So it'll be interesting, you know, here we're, we're looking at, you know, using a, a satellite to look at where your, your, your plant is. It just, you wonder, you know, 40 years from now, will you be able to show this to somebody with a hologram <laughs> or something like that? Sure. So. Um, so this is the plant here. Um, you can see this is all our property here. And this is kind of an older photo, but I can take you through it. Um, this is the main entrance here. This is the main office building. This is the engineering and project management building here. So I'm here under roof. And... Smith Midland's been around for probably close to 70 years now. Uh, and it has grown since then and it's been at this location. So the first part of the plant was just this small building here. <clears throat> uh, that's all it was. And then it's slowly grown. It's been added on to. So this section was added on at one phase. This was added on along with this portion, and then this is an entirely different plant that's also all connected to it that was added on later on. Mm. 
and we've slowly expanded into the other yarded areas. And, and those current, other parts are actually products out there that are still being stored. Waiting that's for correct. Room. Yep. So this is all storage over here um, of different product. And then okay. we've recently expanded in this area here. We've developed, we've bought 15 additional acres here that we're developing. So can you zoom back in and just, you know, not knowing exactly. So the white, the white roofed area that's kind of like that. Yeah, right. So to the right of that, um, just, you know, to, well, to the right, just straight to, yeah, right. A little bit further over. Is that, is that, no, so in between. <laughs> yeah, is that a bed there or what is, or what is that long little section there? Sure. So in Virginia, um, we do occasionally get snow and we do get a fair bit of rain. So all of our manufacturing is actually done on an under roof. Okay. Um, and the further north you go, the more requirement that is. Uh, and the further south you go, the less of a requirement that is. So in right. Texas, most precasters have a large portion of production that's outside, outside. because it's nice out. Um, right. Virginia, you can't do it. You might be able to do it. You just wouldn't be able to produce year round. And then when you get up further north in Minnesota, for instance, you almost have to have everything. Right, right. So, so was that a bed at some point in time? Or I mean, because it's long and narrow made me think that maybe that was some kind of outside. No. So what you're seeing here um, would be, and I guess 3D doesn't do anything different. No. These are racks that move. Uh, things around with our large oh, okay. forklifts. Okay. And then these lines here are panels that you see that we stand vertically okay. on edge and in a rack system. And there's a rack system that long, runs along here and there. And normally we have panels on both sides of it. And we use a large all-terrain crane, which you can see okay. here and you can see the shadow yeah. that we use to move the panels around. So go to the far lower left corner uh, of the image of your property. So it's just right above where it says type here. And so now you've gone a little past it. So right where your cursor, yeah, it goes zoom yep. right in. So that looks to me like material supply. Is that you are correct. Okay. Yep, that, that is our material storage. Okay. So here, these first two bins are sand or fine aggregate. And then these last three are coarse aggregate or gravel. Okay. Okay, so then, then front end loaders come and grab that material to go mix. So where, where is it, do you have a, a mixing operation that you actually produce the concrete? So the front end loader's right here. Okay. He'll come and dump it into a pit right here. And there's a conveyor belt here that runs it up to our batch plant. Okay. So because we do um, both architectural and structural, we have a couple different batch plants. We have this batch plant here, which is batch plant two, it does all our structural work. It's a three cubic yard pan mixer, planetary gear pan mixer. Okay. And it discharges both here in the architectural shop. And I guess I should tell you, this long bay here is the architectural shop. This one here is the structural shop. Um, and mixer two discharges via conveyor belt into both the, arch the structural shop and into the architectural shop. And then further up, you can see two silos here. This is batch plant one, which is the one of the, or if might be the original mixer even, and it's a one cubic yard horizontal shaft mm -hmm. paddle mixer. Um, and it's set up with white cement. That is where all our architectural mix comes out of. Um, so we have smaller aggregate bins up, up above here, and that's where it discharges. It only discharges here in the architectural plant. Okay. It doesn't go here to the structural plant. And then further down here, you can see another silo here. This is batch plant three. A batch plant three does our acoustic sound wall material, mm. um, which isn't traditional concrete. What it is, is it's a proprietary mix of wood chips and just straight cement. There's no aggregate in it. Mm. And it's a non-structural acoustic material that's used on 
panels along the highway to absorb sound, like an acoustic panel. These are the really tall things that run right on, like on either side of the of an interstate, and you've got That's neighborhoods correct. on the other side. Yep, and those walls can be what are called a noise wall or a sound wall. A noise wall is traditionally referred to as just a solid concrete wall, which reflects sound, to where a sound war wall has an acoustic material that actually absorbs, absorbs it, it. Interesting. and detons it. So how big is the property right now that you said, the, the one that, where you have actually uh, product out there? So the whole property here, I think, is 40. 40 acres, and then we've added an additional 15 mm, here okay. that we've expanded onto okay. it. And, so you, oh, go ahead. and I will note we have a rental yard further down, which isn't developed in this photo yet, but we own some property down here that we have a separate barrier rental service or mm. company called Concrete Safety Systems oh, okay. Okay. that okay. they don't produce anything. They purely rent out and install concrete barrier. Right. So this is the, this is the the concrete uh, uh, walls that if you're going through a construction site will be places. Particularly these days, um, they they put that separation between the workers and the and the vehicles Correct. by putting up a wall. Yep. Um, the temporary ones. Right. So I noticed that you're right next to uh, a rail line. Is that intentional? Do you have? I can't see any kind of a connection to the rail line off the property, but is that just circumstance or, or was there any intent of being near rail? So that circumstance, um, what probably put us here originally was, it was property the family owned back in the 60s okay. and that we expand to. There is not a spur was the word you're looking for off the rail. Um, a, that's very expensive um, to install, I remember, in school, we did an analysis of how much volume you'd have to pump through a rail spur in order to justify the cost. Right. It was terrible, <laughs> terribly yeah, expensive. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, and if we were selling widgets that we were shipping a great distance to a different market, there'd probably be an advantage to it. But the rail system here in our country isn't as good as our road system to where shipping stuff on truck is just a better method. So things go out on flatbed? Flatbed or because we make so many panels, we have large A-frame trailers that are custom built okay. that we're able to send panels that are 12 foot tall vertically. Okay, so from the, from the shipping perspective, do you, you own trucks or you, you hire them or, or how does that happen? So we own two tractors. Um, we have two full-time drivers that are on the payroll. And then we own about a dozen specialized sound wall trailers that allow us to send those panels vertically. And we have a couple flat bids. But beyond that, we hire out drivers um, as the demand is needed right. and trailers as well. Could we buy all those ourselves and have a fleet of drivers, yes, it just increases the overhead and trying sure. to keep them busy all the time sure. is yep. quite yep. difficult. You'd have, right. You'd have to have stuff coming and going out of the plant constantly. Kind of Which we'd like to do, but it's, it's always a challenge. Well, this makes for a good transition to talk about transportation and then <laughs> talk about other sure. things. But you're not just a car guy, as you were, you were mentioning, and you were showing me some, some pictures. I'd, I'd seen some before, but but you're a uh, you're a closet uh, carpenter. Well, <laughs> yeah, to a certain extent, I'm all. I should also phrase that I'm cheap. Okay. okay. <laughs> but we like expensive things. Okay. <laughs> so consequently, um, your income's kind of fixed for the most part. But if you want to do more things, but you only have so much income, you, you have to learn to do. Way. You got to find a way, or you wait. Well, we're not necessarily that great at waiting. Uh, so I've learned <laughs> to do a fair bit of stuff myself. Uh, um, the stuff. Well, talk about uh, the place that you bought. So when you went, when you moved out there, you 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 pretty much bought um, some a home on some property, right? That that's correct. So we went straight from uh, living in a hotel that the company was putting us up into searching for a house of 
buying a house. Um, so we were first time home buyers uh, here in Virginia. So that was quite the experience. And it was uh, a place you knew that was going to require some updating. Correct. Right. It, uh, which was fine. We were okay with learning to put some sweat equity into something in order to make it what we wanted. Mm -hmm. And we could see through um, the current condition of what it could be. Right, right. So, so do you want to share some some of your handiwork or? or sure, we can do that. We can look at it if you want to do some, look at something else. So some of the handiwork stuff that we've done, let's see, would be... Uh, it started off with the master bathroom, um, which was, it was nice that we found a place that had a master bath attached to the bedroom, but it was kind of basic builder grade, wasn't anything too special. We didn't mm -hmm. really like it. And it had this massive bathtub and we're, we don't take baths a whole lot. So we didn't necessarily care for it. It only had a single vanity. Uh, so we decided to change it up. So this is the old vanity where the toilet was located at. And we, whoops, that's the wrong direction. And we changed it to this. So we went to a dual vanity with a much larger mirror uh, with lights and the spack splash. And Krista gets the credit for this odd design of the right. hexagonal tile. Yep, very cool. And then because I'm a precaster, this is a concrete. Uh, nice. Uh, countertop that we made. So did you make that at work or did you make that on the property or? I made that at home okay. with the help of people at uh, work of how okay. to do it correctly. Um, so they were a great help. Nice. So that, that is what that area turned into. And then this was that big bathtub that I mentioned. So right. in this same footprint, we went from the large bathtub to a large shower with a dual shower head. Nice. And this is my friend, sure. Matt, who came out from Utah for a visit and he helped me install this glass sliding door that he's on the other side of, which okay. was quite heavy. Okay. Um, and then the we tile. have the, the marble tile. tile. In the middle particularly is, is, is neat. So the, the Krista calls stripe. that the racing stripe. Well, I was going to say that too. <laughs> I was actually going to make that same comment. So that was the master bath. That was the first project. And then the other one was the basement bath, which started out here. And all it was supposed to be was there was some water damage underneath the shower head here on the mm -hmm. drywall. I was mm -hmm. just supposed to replace that. <laughs> well, once I got into it and discovering other things, well, we couldn't just leave it as that. Sure. So it turned into this. So same tub, but all new tile. Uh, I installed all this myself, new toilet, new floor, new vanity, um, in wall medicine cabinet, which are amazing. Now in this photo, the trim work isn't done Still yet, right. I realized. Right. Uh, so is, there, that was a fun is there an Ikea nearby? Is this Ikea stuff or is it uh, um, more home actually, and Lowe's? Or nothing whatever? in here was from Ikea. We have, we do like Ikea stuff. We do occasionally use it. A lot of this was all Lowe's or Home Depot. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, um, so this was bathroom number two. And then bathroom number three was the hall bath, which was the, the most recent one I've done. <clears throat> fairly basic uh, insert, nothing too special. And <clears throat> that turned into this. <laughs> so this yeah. is an Ikea vanity okay. uh, with more marble chevron tile here, new bathtub, uh, another in-wall medicine cabinet. Chris that gets the credit right. yeah. to this yep. edge yep. Here, is yep. here again cool. and new floor and everything. So it went from the master bath, which was the largest project of all three of them, probably took me a year and a half <clears throat> to do. Now I will also point out my first son was born <laughs> at that time. Right, he was right, a great distraction. Right. Right. <laughs> um, the second bathroom took about a year. And then this third one, uh, I did the best job on and it took me only probably four to five months. So I did go quicker. Right. <laughs> in You're a, learning. So how did, um, how was it doing the bathtub? What was, uh, what, that just seems like an interesting thing to have to change out. So it wasn't too terrible. Um, other than I've learned when you cut up uh, fiberglass, you shouldn't use a grinder, even though the grinder goes through it great. It makes a, 
a lot of dust. <laughs> a sawzall would have been better, but the tub itself wasn't too terrible. Um, you can buy now. Granted, it's just a plastic tub. I didn't buy a cast iron tub right, or anything, right, so right, that makes right. a drastic difference. Right, right. Yeah, it just it's you know not something that I mean you see on TV paint the walls and change the vanity and do the tile, uh, but to do the tub yourself, you know, seems like a, a an interesting challenge there. So. Well, sir, it's always fun talking to you. We're, we're out of time uh, for our conversation. It, it's, it's nice to see that, you know, in, in another one of the interviews I had, your experience on the job helps you be comfortable doing some of these things uh, at home. Um, maybe you need to rent your, your, your skills out and make a little, you know, since, since you, you, you've got, I mean, I suspect that there's probably some other stuff you want to do in the house. You're going to need to raise some, some funds for that, you know, so or rent right. out your oh. services, do some work at some other people's houses. Well, good talking to you, sir. I appreciate your time and appreciate you joining me on Let's Be Civil. Not a problem at all. Thanks for having me.